Great. Okay. Thanks everybody for joining. Really appreciate you making the time today to uh, to come and learn about how to start um, or an introduction into uh, legal entity formation for your cooperative enterprise. Um, so I am Ricardo Nunez, um, Director of Economic Democracy at the Sustainable Economies Law Center. And at the Sustainable Econo Economies Law Center, our mission is education, research, advice, and advocacy for just and local economies. Um, and for me, um, I'll, I'll share a bit more throughout the, the, um, the presentation about what that, what that means in practice to me, but um, I'm really proud and excited to, to be with y'all and to be presenting on behalf of the Law Center. So um, before we get started, I just wanna give us all a little roadmap um, to what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I'm going to say this a couple times, but uh, we have all of these resources for free online. Um, probably two that I'm going to highlight right now is our Think Outside the Boss um, manual, how to create and operate a worker-owned business, um, and also a, an entire resource library that we're constantly adding to and adding new states and new sections um, to called cooplaw.org. So that's an online collaborative resource library where we partner with uh, organizations around the country to um, continue to expand the, the legal um, information um, in accessible ways for our communities looking to start cooperatives um, and worker cooperatives specifically. Today, I'm gonna be talking about, um, I'll give a little bit of an introduction into myself and how I came to this work um, to, I'll ask you to, to let me know what you're looking to learn today so to set some expectation. Um, I'm going to be talking about what is a cooperative in general. There's lots of different types of cooperatives, so I'll give a little background on to, um, what cooperatives uh, under the umbrella of uh, cooperative is and then focus in on worker cooperatives. Um, a lot of the content that we're gonna move through today is applicable to producer cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, um, even housing cooperatives, and nonprofits that function like cooperatives. Um, so if you're here and more interested in legal entity formation for a cooperative that isn't a worker cooperative, um, a lot of this content is still going to be useful for you. Um, we're going to talk about the um, legal entities. What are they? Why do they exist? What do we use them for? Why are they important for us? Um, we're going to talk about the most common legal entities for uh, worker cooperatives specifically, but a lot of cooperatives that we deal with, um, consumer and housing and other, limited liability companies, and we'll talk about corporations and what's the difference between the two. Um, and we're going to be talking, and I'll touch on um, nonprofits versus for-profit. A lot of the folks that we come to um, or that we serve and, and are in community with um, are typically trying to do some type of social good. And so they're trying to figure out, should I be a cooperative? Should I be a nonprofit? And so I'll go into some of the considerations there. Um, and then we'll just have some, some coffee talk. So we'll just, we'll just chat um, at the end. So that's, that's the overview um, of what I'll be moving through today. Um, I just want to give a disclaimer that uh, this guy, um, who's talking right now. <laughs> I am not an attorney. Um, so I am a legal apprentice and in California you can um, become an attorney without going to law school. So I'm uh, doing that uh, under the tutelage of one of my coworkers. Um, and next year I'll become eligible to take the bar. And uh, after, uh, after I pass the bar, I'll have my license to practice law. So a little bit um, quickly about how I came to this work. Um, I uh, was doing Peace Corps in Zambia in South Central Africa for two and a half years. And this is my house and my little sister is um, sitting, sitting on my patio right there. And um, when I was introduced to the village, I um, said, I'm, I'm here to do uh, teacher training, but I'm here to serve the community. So what do you want me to do? And what they uh, said was a group of women stood up and they said, we want to start a women's cooperative. And so I said, sure, I'll help you out. I didn't know what a co-op was at the time, but um, over the next two, two and a half years, um, 
uh, the group on the bottom right, the uh, Tubombeche Women's Cooperative, and then in a, a, a village nearby, also wanted to start a women's cooperative, the Tukatane Women's Cooperative. They actually taught me about cooperatives. And so that was my, my um, introduction and, and education into what cooperatives can do and, and the power that they can have. When I came back to the States, um, I met a group of folks at the uh, LA Eco Village, and we started a study group to try to figure out how um, we could start a resource center for worker cooperatives in LA. And when I was doing some research, um, I came up to the San Francisco Bay Area because there were literally no worker co-ops in Southern California for me to talk with and to figure out what resources they needed. And so I met Janelle Orsi, who's here, who wrote the law practicing law on the sharing economy helping people build cooperatives, social enterprises, and local sustainable economies. And, um, and as I was interviewing her, asking her what the legal resources, legal needs for worker cooperatives were, she started asking me questions about, um, about my future and uh, asked me if I wanted to come up to the Bay Area, do worker cooperative development, and become an attorney without going to law school. And so here I am today. But as we move into the subject, like what do lawyers do? Um, I was kind of like, I had this thing where it's like, oh, lawyers go, um, they litigate, that's what they do. Um, or maybe they become politicians and they're writing the laws. But actually a lot of attorneys um, are what are called corporate business or transactional law attorneys. And they're the ones who are writing agreements, um, helping businesses and organizations navigate regulations, um, figuring out taxes, setting up their, their organizations and managing their risk. And most of those attorneys have been greasing the wheels of an economy that's extractive, that's exploitative, that's harming our, um, our communities and our earth. And so what the initial vision of the Sustainable Economies Law Center was, was to start greasing a different set of wheels. So time banks, nonprofits, community supported agriculture, eco villages, um, the sharing economy before it became uh, corporatized um, and worker cooperatives and cooperatives of all time kinds. So what do worker co-op uh, attorneys do? They do, they help, they help clients and organizations and, and mutual aid groups write agreements and structure entities and navigate real estate laws and can contracts and manage intellectual property. And a lot of the work at the Sustainable Economies Law Center um, is focused on is helping the people who cannot access legal services right now, um, get uh, legal resources that they need to help build this visionary just economy of the future. Because right now um, there's a tragedy of the marketplace. A lot of people talk about the tragedy of the commons, but what we have with a lot of areas of our economy is a tragedy of the market where left to its own devices, um, people who actually can Need, need those resources can't access them because they're either not low income enough to access free legal services or not rich enough to pay an attorney $400 an hour um, to, uh, to work with them. And so um, like what, when an organization is trying to figure out what does it mean to have employees, there's a lot of hoops that you're going to have to jump through. Um, and so typically the people who can navigate those hoops are the wealthy. And so those are the ones who, like right now, as we're seeing with a lot of these federal, state, and local relief that's coming through because of COVID-19, a lot of the bigger corporations have a bevy of attorneys and uh, departments to navigate those laws and to figure out how to access that capital when it's our communities, locally, small businesses, and cooperatives that need those resources the most. And so um, I think this, just to uh, to to um, so center us in, in this time right now. Um, I just wanted to to recognize that that this is happening. That we're in a moment of crisis. We're in a moment um, where uh, our world is turned upside down, and a lot of people are frightened and scared. And um, there's a different response that we can have as as individuals and as communities is to come together. Um, and to participate in thinking through how can we build an economy that responds fundamentally in different ways to crises like these. So, um, so yeah, so I just wanted to, to recognize that.
So before I jump into all the legal nitty gritty um, uh, of legal entity formations and different cooperative enterprises, I just wanted to, to uh, center us and, and ground us and say, don't worry, I'm gonna be going through a lot of content, a lot of information, um, but all of this stuff, like I said, is uh, online, free for download. Act fast, because there's an infinite amount of uh, resources. Uh, just like um, creating, uh, we have uh, template handbooks for worker cooperatives that are limited liability companies, handbook for a worker cooperative corporation. Like I mentioned before, we have a whole manual that goes from start to finish the steps of starting and operating a worker cooperative. Um, and we have that online legal resource library um, for cooperatives. So before I move into an introduction into cooperatives, feel free to um, type into the chat um, questions that you have that you want me to make sure to maybe slow down a little bit um, when I get to that section or, or if I'm moving through this content, feel free to ask questions in the chat. But um, yeah, just curious why people, if you can write into the chat, um, what's one thing that you wanna learn today um, on on this webinar. So I'll give folks a, a second to um, to write those in. And again, yes, at the end we're going to have um, we're going to have some time to chat and and talk about the content that I work through um, at, at the end of the of the um, webinar. So yeah, and that's mostly because we're recording this, and so just just so we can get to that point, I'll stop recording and we can feel maybe a little bit more free. So more information about how to form a residential cooperative. Okay. Anything else? What um, what brought you here today? What you're wanting to learn? Worker co-op basics, where to get more information. Definitely. Mm, legal structures for multi-stakeholder cooperatives. That's awesome. Okay. And then how to register as a tax generating body. Very technical terms. <laughs> Appreciate that, thanks. Um, community wealth building as a network of cooperatives supporting each other. That is exciting. I love that. Um, and how profitable can co-ops be? Ooh, I love these questions. Okay, feel free to keep keep writing in what you're wanting from today if you have questions, and we'll make sure to um, come back to them at the end, or I'll try to slow down when I get to them um, uh, later. So, cooperative foundations. Um, I think when I first heard of cooperatives, um, I thought of this. I thought of um, affluent, mostly uh, white folks who were coming together, going out and, and trying to live off the grid and, and living that, that hippie lifestyle um, that I didn't have any personal uh, connection to. Um, and so, a lot of times when we're when I think when I talk to folks um, about co-ops, this is sometimes a, a common a common conception of uh, what people think of who populates co-ops. But in fact, communities, um, low-income communities, communities of color, marginalized communities, um, just everyday working people have found power in cooperatives. And in fact, um, there's this great book called Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice by Jessica gordon Ebhart, which details um, the, the struggles and the um, cooperative responses that African-American and Black communities in the U.S. have uh, done, have responded to white supremacy um, and uh, racialized capitalism for them to build economic power for themselves. So it's a great book and there's a lot of other books like that and stories that actually are rewriting cooperative history um, right now. Um, so what is a cooperative? Um, I get a lot of times when I'm talking about different types of cooperatives, sort of what's the umbrella of cooperatives, what's the definition? And so there's actually an international cooperative alliance that it connects cooperative sectors from all over the world. Um, and their definition is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. Yeah, that's a mouthful. <laughs> so for myself, when I'm thinking about cooperatives, when I'm working with um, clients uh, at the law center, um, for me, I think 
the easiest way for me to get this across and to make sure to frame the conversation appropriately is that a cooperative is member owned, member controlled, and member benefiting. Um, and so what does that mean in practice or how, does, how do we distinguish a cooperative from a typical business or a typical enterprise? So what does it mean to be uh, member owned? Well, um, a cooperative is jointly owned by its members. So it's really important as you're thinking about what type of cooperative that you want to set up, who its members are going to be. Somebody already mentioned a multi-stakeholder, what's a, a multi-stakeholder cooperative. The multi-stakeholder cooperative is when there's more than one um, class of membership, and we can get into that later. So um, this is, uh, in contrast, a member-owned cooperative is in contrast to a for traditional for-profit business where it's owned by one or a few individuals or shareholders whose main interest is generating a profit. The second is it's member controlled. So co-ops are run by the democratic principle of one member, one vote. Um, and a, what was it? And so the so a cooperative is, is economic democracy in practice. It doesn't mean that because you have more money, like in a conventional business, uh, if you have more money invested, then you have more power to say how that company is run or how it operates. In a cooperative, it's one member, one vote. So whatever money that you put in, it might be different from, um, and we'll get into maybe a little bit more of the nuances of investing in cooperatives as members, but it doesn't matter how much relative to others that you've invested, it's one member, one vote. It's about recentering people power and um, separating out a, a in, what is it? Investment money and power relationships. So, um, and then the third is that it's member benefiting. So cooperatives are operated for the benefit of their members. Um, and so what this means in practice is that there's uh, any of the earnings that are created by the cooperative are given back to the members after, after say a taxable year and given and the, the profits or what we call surplus in a cooperative is given back to the members um, based on their patronage. There's some technical jargon uh, terms and, and hopefully uh, you'll forgive me for using them and I can explain them a little bit later. Or you can put in the chat when I'm using a term that, um, that sounds a little funky and you wanna know a little bit more about it. But in a cooperative, in, and let's say in a worker cooperative, it, what that means in practice is instead of getting a return of profits or surplus, at the end of the year, based on how much I'm invested financially, I get a return on the profits um, based on how much value I've contributed to the cooperative. And a lot of worker co-ops typically do that by how many hours somebody has worked relative to the others. So if I've worked 10% of the hours over the year, I get 10% of the profits at the end. And so this is really centering the value that's contributed in a cooperative is what um, is the return is the basis of the return that you're going to get at the end of the year. And this is in contrast to an investor owned business where profits are distributed, not by how much value somebody's contributed, but just how much money somebody has invested. So it's a system that incentivizes rich people to become richer and not allowing working and everyday people who are contributing value to these companies um, to, to see that return themselves. So I sort of touched on this a little bit, but I just want to like deepen this a little bit more because I think right now in this time of crisis of um, uncertainty, uh, people are really seeing the existing system and the way that it operates in, a, in really stark terms. Um, and so I'll, when I do these presentations, I'll, I'll ask folks, what are principles of conventional or capitalist businesses? Um, and, and people, uh, Typically, I think most of the time understand that there's only one responsibility for a typical business, and it's to maximize shareholder profits. That is, that is the sole function of, um, of a typical business. And it's not only philosophers or theorists that are saying this. This is actually part of the legal code in the United States. Um, there's this uh, shareholder pri uh, primacy norm that was instituted by a very famous case in, the, um, in 1919 and has been reinforced over and over again that a business corporation is organized and carried on primarily for the profit of the stakeholders, uh, stockholders. Um, the power 
um, powers of the directors are to be employed for that end. So the whole purpose of our economic system and the way that we structure corporations and businesses is to maxim maximize stockholder return. That's it. Um, all of these um, benefit corporations or um, flexible purpose corporations and those types of things are all ways that um, folks have tried to figure out how can we start to put in a little bit of protection so that these companies can do some social good purposes without um, shareholders um, suing the board of directors because they're not getting the maximum profits. Um, so when we're talking about cooperatives, um, I mentioned the international definition, but a lot of um, cooperatives uh, ascribe to a set of principles that were actually created by um, these uh, gentlemen in this, in this picture, the Rochdale pioneers. In um, England during the Industrial Revolution, there were artisans who were getting displaced by machines, by automation. Um, and they came together and created a grocery cooperative and created a set of principles that have evolved and, and been refined over the years, but have prayed, stayed pretty um, steady. And the seven cooperative principles are voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, member economic participation, autonomy and independence, education and training, education, training and information, cooperation among cooperatives, and the seventh is concern for community. So these seven cooperatives are the backbone of international cooperative, um, of cooperatives internationally. So I think a lot of people think that cooperatives are really niche. They're really, you know, they're, they're um, you know, they don't actually make up a significant amount of our economic activity in the United States. But in fact, there's um, almost 30,000 cooperatives that operate 73,000 places of businesses throughout the U.S. Um, they generate $654 billion in revenue, have through more than $3 trillion in assets. Over 2 million jobs are created through cooperative enterprises um, that give out $75 billion in annual wages. Um, and these are all types of cooperatives. So here we have an uh, electric cooperative, um, a picture of folks on, on the uh, electric pole. Um, a lot of rural communities uh, did not have access to electricity because businesses did not find it profitable for them to set them up. And so these rural communities came together to create electric cooperatives. Um, and now you'll find across the country a lot of rural communities coming together to do something similar with broadband and, and internet access. Um, consumer cooperatives, the largest being REI co-op. Um, uh, that's an example of a consumer co-op where when you go to consume uh, the, the service, the goods that are being sold by REI, you can buy a membership and at the end of the year, you get a refund based on how much um, you've bought. Also, um, a lot of people don't realize that credit unions are actually financial cooperatives. So there's already these um, existing uh, organizations and entities in our communities that we, if you have an account at a credit union, um, then you are actually already a member of a cooperative and you can vote for the board of directors for that credit union. And there's a really exciting example here in the Bay Area where a group of worker co-op advocates came together, um, opened up accounts at a credit union and then voted themselves onto the board of directors so that they could start finding ways to to um, open up capital access to worker cooperatives in the Bay Area. There's also housing cooperatives, um, which are a really uh, prevalent example in, in the Bay Area. The Berkeley Student um, Cooperative Houses, there's 17 houses, um, and they um, are actually now trying to find ways to, to support other um, cooperative sectors. And then the last um, that I'll mention here is um, the Minnesota Cooperative Creameries Association, which uh, later became Lando Lakes, and it's where small farmers came together to, to sell their produce um, together under one brand and also to have quality control and, and to, to those economies of scale. Um, so the cooperative economy is largely hidden and part of our work is, is to lift that up. Um, 
so I just wanted to mention a few worker co-ops that um, that have inspired me through my uh, seven, nine years of working with cooperatives. Um, so the cheese board in the middle is a worker cooperative. Um, they actually were a conversion. So it was a couple who um, owned a, a cheese shop and pizzeria in Berkeley and decided to sell it to their employees. And so the employees bought it. And now there's, I believe, between 50 and 60 worker owners there. Um, it's been operating for, for decades and was actually the founding member of the Arizmendi Association of Cooperatives, which is a really exciting example in the Bay Area. Um, Cooperative Home Care Associates is the largest worker cooperative. When people think about worker cooperatives, I think a lot of people think about small five, 12, 20 people um, businesses or enterprises. Cooperative Home Care Associates has over 2,000 workers, and I believe over 1,600 of them are worker owners. Um, in the top left, we have Mandela Grocery Cooperative. They've been a really um, exciting example of how a worker cooperative responds differently in a crisis. Um, they're a grocery store here in Oakland, um, in a in a, in a food food uh, desert in West Oakland, primarily African American community, and um, to provide them with health access to healthy foods at affordable prices, and and they've been um, a really amazing resource during uh, the shelter in place. Um, at the top right, uh, there's the Design Action Collective, which is a um, design and graf graphic design firm here in Oakland. And it's interesting because um, in the center of Silicon Valley of tech entrepreneurship, this was a space where um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, trans folks, queer folks could come together and work in a space that honors them and doesn't make them feel alienated, whereas the rest of the tech industry is beating themselves over the head trying to figure out how to have diversity and inclusion in their workplaces. Um, and then the final example, New Era Windows Cooperative is uh, a windows and doors factory in Chicago. And it actually has a really interesting history. I'd, I'd recommend looking into it where the workers did a um, sit-in, the first sit-in in I think 40 years and were able to um, pressure the owners who had laid everyone off with no, without paying them their, their wages or, or back pay. Um, and they were able to um, find a way to, to buy the assets and convert their business to a worker co-op. Um, just going to touch really briefly on that if you're starting a cooperative enterprise, there are cooperative associations there to support you, um, whether it's a housing cooperative or a consumer cooperative, producer cooperative, there are cooperative associations that their, their core purpose is to support that cooperative sector. And for me, um, the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives has been an amazing resource during this crisis. They have been responding by making sure that worker cooperatives around the country have the resources and education that they need to, to re get access to these federal resources that are coming available and are daily updating their website to make sure that um, worker co-ops have uh, the understanding of how to navigate what um, resources um, are available whether they're grants or loans, how to apply for them, and, and what to do in this time. Um, these are old numbers, I think. Um, what was it? The, uh, this is just to give you a sense of how many worker cooperatives are around the country. Um, this was from 2016, I believe, um, where they had estimated there were 357 worker cooperatives in democratic workplaces around the country. Now that number is closer to 800, I believe. Um, but just to give you a sense, we are a very small but mighty, mighty um, group of uh, folks around the country uh, doing this building worker cooperatives and economic democracy in the workplace. Um, I'm going to skip over a few of these really quick. It's just I've mentioned that there is an international cooperative alliance. Um, connecting cooperatives. And so if you become a worker cooperative or, or start one and connect with the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops is a member of CICOPA, which is the International Worker Cooperative Alliance. Um, CICOPA is an acronym for uh, words in French, so I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, but, the, but we are part of an international movement building a cooperative economy. Um, common barriers. 
So if cooperatives are so great, why aren't there more of them? I think um, awareness of cooperatives as an option has, is a huge barrier, probably one of the biggest, um, biggest barriers. So whether it's entrepreneurs or um, cities or uh, other types of resources, then most people don't know what a cooperative is or they have a misconception of what a cooperative is. Um, and also the technical assistance for people starting cooperatives is really thin. And so part of the work at the Law Center is to help build a national legal foundation for the worker cooperative and cooperative sectors generally. Um, we're also supporting um, accountants around the country through our Cooperative Professionals Guild or our membership in the Cooperative Professionals Guild, which is a community of lawyers and accountants coming together to teach each other, build community and build um, understanding and, and, and deepen our expertise in, um, in cooperative law and accounting. And also a lot of the work that we're doing is policy advocacy. So on the city, regional, state and federal levels, um, there's a lot of resource advocacy that we're doing, but we're just at the beginning and it's really exciting, the momentum that um that we're getting that we're having um was it just to respond to a few questions we are going to send out the slides we're going to send out um the recording after this and uh, we'll send links to all the resources that i mentioned on today's uh, webinar um and a lot of times when we're talking about worker cooperative at scale people don't think it can be done but it already is being done and you look at italy um, in, in what is now one of the areas that's being devastated by COVID-19. Um, there's in Emilia Romana, a region, um, there's huge cooperative networks um, there of worker cooperatives. It's a really interesting story, really, really vibrant um, cooperative economy there, um, where 10% of the workforce is employed by cooperatives. And in Northern Spain, in the Basque region, there's the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation, which is an umbrella corporation with 110 cooperatives underneath it, 147 subsidiary companies, eight foundations, a benefit society. They have a university. Um, it's just a really amazing um, uh, example of a cooperative at scale. But I think one of the things that people sometimes miss is that that whole region is, is a cooperative economy and Mondragon is just the largest um, piece of it. So now into the meat of the legal nitty gritty um, pieces. Um, so entities, legal entities. What are legal entities? Why do we form them? What is limited liability? What are common legal entities? So um, the legal entities that I'm gonna be talking about today are limited liability companies, general stock corporations, and cooperative corporations. I'm not going to, I'm going to touch on nonprofit, um, nonprofits, but I'm not going to be talking about nonprofit benefit, mutual benefit corporations, I'm not talking about California benefit corporations or flexible purpose or B Corps. Um, and the reason is, is that most cooperatives that we've worked with um, over the last uh, 10 years have uh, been, have started uh, LLCs um, or cooperative corporations. Sometimes they'll use the general stock and I'll, and I'll get into the, to why that is. So what is a legal entity? A legal entity is um, a structure and rules um, under which a business uh, operates. So basically um, an entity determines things like how businesses govern, how liability is allocated, um, how business is taxed. So like I mentioned, some common examples are general stock, worker cooperative corporation, and a limited liability company. So should you form a legal entity? Well, the things to consider when you're thinking about forming a legal entity, the first is liability. So um, how much, uh, what damage, what harm could be caused? What could people sue you for? Um, if you have employees, what could they sue the company for or you? So, um, different, so liability issues. Second thing to think about is tax treatment. So how do you wanna be taxed? Um, and the third is mission. So, so as you're forming this organization or enterprise, thinking about um, how, how can you uh, institutionalize this idea, uh, the mission of your organization. Um, so we'll get into some of the costs around formation. Um, uh, what was it? When you're thinking through mission and formation, what are the goals of the organization? 
um, a question that you really should be grappling with is who do you want to have control of the enterprise? Now, what type of capital requirements are you are you going to be needing to to get this organization off the ground? And so, if you start operating a business, or no, let's just say you start baking cookies and you start selling them to the public, you are operating as a business, and the government, when they look at this, they see business activity and they consider you a business. And so a default um, way that the, that the government looks at you is they say, okay, you're a sole proprietorship if you're one person, and if you're working with somebody, then you're a partnership. And if you haven't formed a legal entity, this is the default presumption by the courts and by the government. And so what does this mean in practice? Well, it means that you have unlimited liability. So um, somebody can sue you for if they get sick from your cookies, um, and then, uh, what was it? And not only can they come after any of the assets of what you put into running that business, but they can come after your house, they can come after your car, they can come after your bank accounts. Um, so it's totally unlimited. Um, a benefit of not forming a legal entity in California is that when you do form a legal entity, you have to pay $800 a year minimum um, entity tax to the state. Um, and you would be, if you're a sole proprietor um, or a partnership, you'd be taxed on the individual level. So each person has to figure out how much you're going to allocate of the process of profits and losses to your individual um, income statements and not at an entity level. Um, another thing that you do avoid as well is having to do um, organizational documents. Um, so you don't have to file the paperwork with the state. Um, and you don't have to necessarily write up a um, operating agreement or bylaws. You can just start operating. So if you want to get something off the ground really quick, um, not have to pay $800 a year, and you don't think that people are really going to sue you, you can start operating and, and, and working through it. So if you're worried about how to protect yourself, um, how, how would you do that? Um, and this is where the corporate or limited liability shield comes in handy. Um, where well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what that does. So the pros of entity formation is it limits liability. So um, any of the activities of the business, if somebody wants to sue you, they can only go after the assets um, of the business. They can't come after your personal assets. So it's sort of a shield between your business, business um, assets and your personal assets. Also, um, it provides credibility. So when, you're, uh, form, when you formed an entity, banks, lenders, other organizations see you as more credible. Um, it's also a way to attract investors. Um, and when you form a legal entity, you can actually decide how you want to be taxed. So there's all these different tax categories, um, and you can decide which one you want to fall under. And also you get to decide and, um, and your governance structure so that others have to abide by that, that structure. Some cons, like I mentioned. There's that additional tax that you have to pay, um, the minimum franchise tax of $800 per year. There's the corporate formalities, and then there's the time and cost of working with the attorney, writing, filling out the documents, and those types of things, um, and, and sending them to the state. Um, here's an example of one of those legal documents. So this is the first page of the uh, operating agreement for an LLC that we worked with um, to create a, for a, a popsicle company. And so there's popsicles. Um, and actually, this uh, operating agreement is on our cooplaw.org website. It's free for download. Um, and we use cartoons to explain the different ways that the, the cooperative is going to operate and organize itself. Um, so a limited liability company, what is the differences between limited liability company and a corporation? Well, an LLC is not a corporation. It is a flexible business entity, um, So, which means that there's not a lot of corporate formalities in the, in the statutory code that you have to abide by. It's very flexible. You can organize it in all lots of different ways. Um, it's, it creates a limited liability shield. Um, so it's, so people can't come after your personal assets. The thing that binds the different partners, those are the owners in a limited liability company, the partners um, or members, the thing that binds them 
is an uh, operating agreement that they sign. And it's basically just a contract between the people to say, this is how we're going to manage uh, or govern and manage this, this company. This is how we're going to distribute um, losses and profits and, and, and all those types of things. There's low level of corporate formalities. Like I said, um, the statutory code doesn't really require you to, you know, um, make sure that you send out meeting minutes or send, or you have to send out notice so many days or weeks before a meeting of the board of directors, et cetera. And there's actually no requirement for an LLC to have a board of directors. Um, so something you can do if you want to start as an LLC is uh, you and want to start as a cooperative, you can incorporate a one member, one vote principle, but it's not required by law. And the thing about, uh, one of the downsides of an LLC is that it's very flexible and so it can be changed um, by future members so they can basically make it um, non-cooperative in the future if they wanted to. A benefit of an LLC is that um, members are considered partners and not employees. So if you're looking for ways to not have to um, abide by employment um, laws or uh, because maybe you all are starting a company you don't have the resources, capital to pay yourself minimum wage um, and navigate all of the requirements for having employees. You want to start as a partnership so um, to overcome those, those barriers. LLC is a great model for that. Um, the taxation for LLCs, the default taxation is passed through, which means that there's no taxation at the entity level, that it gets attributed to each individual member. Um, and sometimes that can cause some uh, confusion, it can kind of cause some um, tensions between the members because you're always going to have to allocate those profits and losses to everyone. And so finding ways that are equitable um, can, be, can be difficult. Um, yeah, and also you can't hold that money in the cooperative because the, cooper the LLC sorry, itself is not an entity that can hold that money. All the profits and losses have to be allocated to somebody. So again, big benefit of an LLC is that it limits your liability so people can only go after your business assets and not your personal assets. So um, what was it? One of the one of the groups that we work with a lot um, are folks with mixed documentation backgrounds. And so um, it, in the United States, it is illegal to knowingly hire an undocumented individual. But in the United States, or I should say, and in the United States, um, it is totally fine for a foreign national to own a business here. And so LLCs being partnerships, foreign nationals um, can own parts of those businesses. Um, and so one of the requirements uh, that LLCs and all co actually companies have, if you have an employee, so you have to collect I-9s, which is the statement of, um, of residency in the United States and, and keep it on file. If you're a partner in an LLC, you don't need to, you, you don't need to collect those I-9s. Um, LLC worker cooperative members can avoid employee status because they're self-employed business owners and therefore not hired by the co-op. Um, but really, the, it's not just a magic sort of like, okay, I'm a partner. I don't have to um, consider myself an employee. It really is about power and authority in, in, the, in the organization itself. Um, and so those practices are what the courts are going to look at when they are trying to determine whether or not somebody is actually an employee if you're calling those folks partners um, or members in an LLC and trying to avoid that employee classification. And so there's certain things you can do to make sure that your cooperative, if you're trying to avoid employment status for a variety of reasons, um, there's a, certain things that you should be doing to make sure that you're um, making your case the strongest and, and just in case you have to go um, before a court to, um, uh, to argue that. And so giving, um, making the organization as flat as possible, non-hierarchical as possible, avoid direct supervision, you can have roles that rotate, so um, trying to find innovative or different ways that make the hierarchy flat and that distribute power and authority um, and et cetera. So 
here's some of those uh, things that you can do if you're trying to avoid employee, employee mint status in an LLC. Um, here, just to reiterate that last point, the circle is meant to say that everyone is equal, they're coming together, um, and they're equally managing this uh, business enterprise to avoid um, not being considered employees. Um, an example of uh, this type of structure in the Bay Area is Home Green Home. It's a worker cooperative in San Francisco of Latina um, and Latinas. Um, and all of the worker owners are partners in the cooperative. They participate in management and they have, as a result of the fact that they're a cooperative and do this, they have higher than industry wages. Um, it's a really exciting um, company to look at. Um, general Stock Corporation. So we're moving from limited liability companies to corporations now. So General Stock Corporation, when people talk about C corporations, um, which is a tax status, um, people are typically talking about general stock corporations. They're owned by shareholders, they're profit driven, um, they're governed by a board of directors, the shares of stock usually exchange for capital contributions, voting power is directly related to how much you've invested, um, and as far as taxation, a corporation in the eyes of the law is considered a person, and so uh, a legal person, and so that legal person is taxed um, at the entity level, and then any any money that uh, is given to the uh, the shareholders, that money is taxed at the individual income level. So you have double taxation um, uh, in a corporate in a corporation. Sorry. So here's a to distinguish between an LLC and a corporation. You have a corporation, and then all of the shareholders. Now, how can we incorporate cooperative values into a uh, general stock corporation? Well, we can make all of the members shareholders. Um, we can make it democratic, and we can try to, to write into the bylaws um, a ways to distribute profits based on value contributed and, and not necessarily how much you've invested. Um, there are more corporate formalities, and also as far as employment, um, because the corporation is considered a legal person, you as a worker owner, um, are considered an employee of that person. Um, and so there's a presumption that anybody working at a, in a, under a corporation is considered an employee, even if there are, even if they are also owners of that corporation. Now, thankfully in California, we have a cooperative corporation, which creates an entity that, um, that institutionalizes and embeds cooperative practices into the statutory code. So we have one here in California. Um, here's a few examples, Rainbow Grocery, um, which I believe has over uh, 240 worker owners, the Cheese Board, which I mentioned, and Ayers Mendy Bakeries um, around the Bay Area. Um, they are all cooperative corporations. So they incorporate cooperative principles. They operate at cost for members. That's the, the purpose of a cooperative corporation. And there are certain legal requirements that every member has a vote. And typically what that means for a corporation, because they are required to have a board of directors, is that all members get to vote on the board of directors once a year. Um, and you can deepen that democratic practice, but that is the legal threshold requirement of a cooperative corporation. Also, if it's important for you to have cooperative in your name, cooperative corporations are the only legal entity allowed in California to have the word cooperative in their name. So if that's something that's important to you, then this would be the, the, entity, the entity that you'd want to look at. Um, also, there's a special tax deduction available for cooperative corporations. So I remember I was talking about that double um, taxation at the corporate entity level. Well, for a cooperative corporation, any income generated by its members um, is not taxed at the corporate level. And so that's a benefit that the IRS has designated to cooperatives. A few years ago, the Sustainable Economies Law Center with a host of other organizations came together to create a legal entity specifically for worker cooperatives. It's underneath the cooperative corporation um, statute and you can elect to become a worker cooperative corporation, um, which allows, um, what was it, which allows you to 
uh, ask any California members to invest up to $1,000 into the cooperative. No other entity can do that. Um, and it's actually really hard when you try to invest in your local economy because of all the security laws that are um, consumer, pro consumer protection laws around investments um, that stop people from investing in their local economy. And so we wanted to create an, an avenue, a way for people to invest in worker cooperatives. Um, another thing that we did was define what a worker cooperative was under the statutory code, which has allowed us, while we're doing advocacy at the city level, to, to point to a state level statute and say, this is what a, the definition of a worker cooperative is, give these types of businesses and enterprises um, resources, more resources um, and streamline permitting and et cetera, different processes like that. So again, cooperatives are not about money equaling power, it's about people equaling power. Um, and sometimes when people talk about why worker ownership, why worker cooperatives, why cooperatives in general, um, there have been studies that have shown that in cooperatives, there's higher job satisfaction. They actually have higher than industry in, um, income. They're actually more sustainable and more involved in a local community. And they actually have more resiliency in economic downturns. Um, just because I think we might be running a little bit short on time, I'm uh, going to skip over a little bit about what is governance. That's, that's what governance is. Um, to talk a little bit about structure. So how you can structure co worker cooperatives particularly. Um, so there's sort of two sides of the spectrum and there's lots of space in between to play around with it. But typically what you'll see in a cooperative is um, either a representative board, like we have at Alvarado Street Bakery, which um, has a few hundred worker owners and they all decide to elect a board of directors and that board of directors makes those governance decisions or you can have a collective board which means that all the members of the cooperative sit on the board of directors and so they're all collectively making those governance decisions as well um, and this is sorry this is for cooperative corporations for llc's these are not requirements that the state um, requires your business to do so for a corporation, you have to have a board of directors, and those are two ends of the spectrum of how to structure your board, um, either representative or collective. Um, and then also another thing that the, the uh, California state requires you to have are officers. So a secretary, a president, a treasurer, and really these um, officer positions can really just be um, figureheads, just so that the state knows who to contact. And if you've ever interacted with a cooperative, sometimes it can be hard to be like, who do I talk to? Who's the boss? Because there is no one boss. Um, power is distributed. And so um, the state just wants to know, okay, who's the person who we need to contact who signed these documents um, for the state of California? Who's the one who's keeping, who's the point person um, for the finances, et cetera. So what is management? It's implementation of all those governance decisions, um, the strategies, the policies, and the ones carrying out the day-to-day -day activities. So um, to review, what are legal entities and why do we form them? Uh, they, they, uh, legal entities are the structures of how we're going to operate our businesses and we form them to limit our liability. Limited liability is to protect our personal assets from our business assets. Um, and the most common forms of legal entity are California cooperative corporations, limited liability companies. And if you don't want to form a legal entity yet, um, then the default, if you're working with more than one person, is a partnership. Um, I'm going to skip over the cooperative as a tax category for now. Um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of people come to us and they're trying to start a cooperative because they want to do some social good and they want to make it participatory and democratic. Um, and a lot of times when we're talking to them, we are trying to figure out, okay, what are you trying to do? Um, and trying to make sure that they're getting the appropriate legal entity that will meet their needs. Um, and so in California, a nonprofit, there's the most common is the California Public Benefit Corporation. So it's a corporation. So you have to have a board of directors um, and it makes it a lot easier to get that IRS tax um, status, a 501c3 tax exemption. Um, but you have to be organized for a charitable purpose. 
So for example, relief of the poor, lessens the burden of the government, et cetera. And so when you're thinking about forming your entity or your organization, here are four questions that we usually um, move through when we're talking to folks about whether or not you should really form a cooperative corporation or an LLC to be a cooperative or to form as a nonprofit. So the four are purpose, control, funding, and profits. So I'm gonna go over these really quick. So purpose, who do you primarily hope to benefit? Is it the members of the cooperative? Are you mostly looking to, to benefit the members? Um, or are you looking to benefit uh, some charitable class or the community at large? Um, and can you articulate an exempt purpose? Um, so if you're looking for the cooperative to do some social good in the world and not necessarily um, um, primarily benefit the members, then maybe a nonprofit is more useful for you. Um, the second is control. Who do you want to have control? So in a cooperative, the members have democratic control. But in a nonprofit, it is legally required that the board of directors oversees the nonprofit's activities and that the board of directors is majority disinterested people. So they can't be parts of the communities that you're trying to serve or benefit. Um, third is funding. How are you going to get the funding to start and to operate your business? Do you think that the services and goods that you're going to be providing are going to generate enough income to provide a meaningful income for your workers, for, for the folks at the organization? Um, or are you gonna have to rely on outside donations, foundations, et cetera, to be able to, to operate um, your organization? Now this one, it can get a little gray area because there are some nonprofits that primarily provide services and goods for communities and that's generally how they they opt um, to generate their income the YMCA is a great example they're a nonprofit entity and they're offering services that anybody can access but then they do charitable activities um, for their charitable class um, also just another little asterisk into um, nonprofits if you're looking to start a nonprofit, you can actually engage in business activities. You're just going to be taxed on those activities like a business as opposed to receiving that income um, and not having to be taxed on it. So the fourth factor is profits. What do you want to do with the money that's left over um, in, in the organization? Do you want to give it do you do you want to give it to its members, the members of the cooperative, or do you or if you're a nonprofit, it's legally required that you reinvest that money into a charitable purpose. So those are the four factors that um, you should be thinking about as you're thinking um, through whether or not to start a for-profit or non-profit. Um, and even if you're a non-profit, it doesn't mean you necessarily can't be a cooperative or act um, under the cooperative principles. We have a network of organizations around the country that we are a part of, that we're supporting, um, called the Nonprofit Democracy Network, where we have recognized that if we are trying to transform the world, we need to make sure that we are also transforming ourselves and our organization. And so we have incorporated democratic practices into our nonprofit workplaces and taken the learnings and wisdom from the cooperative community and put them into, um, into our nonprofits. So there's a whole, a host of resources and ways that you can do that in relationship to the board in relationship to each other so the bottom line is that a for-profit business benefits its owners and a nonprofit organization is an organization dedicated to serving the community at large so think about those four factors um, if you're trying to think about what type of legal entity to, to incorporate as when you're starting your organization so I think that's, um, that's it for the formal part of my presentation. So I'm gonna stop the recording and give myself a little water. <laughs> 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 and really appreciate everybody's questions throughout. I really wanna like jump into all of this stuff too. <laughs>